Thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Uh, before I invite our guest on stage, I want to start off with a quote. Um, we will scour the Eastern Bloc to find someone who can take down Dan Gable. That's what the coach of the 1972 Soviet Olympic wrestling team said about today's talks at Google Guest. Dan is from Waterloo, Iowa, and quickly, and quickly got into wrestling growing up, always looking to train, to exercise, tanking the, the layman's concept of what we know as Rocky Balboa to drastic new levels. Unlike most athletes, Dan didn't wrestle to overcome his opponent. He, in many ways, wrestled to overcome himself. Never intimidated because it was himself he was challenging. Every match, every run, every chin up, trying to push himself beyond what he knew was possible. Teammates would have to carry Dan off of the wrestling mats after practice. So, go figure, he won a lot all of the time, every single time through high school and then the NCAA championships, setting new records and amazing the world which followed him. And then one match, his last college wrestling match, he lost, and, and he learned so much from that defeat that he went on to become America's Olympic hero, who went through the Olympics unscored on, and then continued as Team USA wrestling coach, coaching eight medalists, four of which were gold. Dan also became the head coach of the University of Iowa, leading the Hawkeyes to 15 NCAA championships, crowning 45 champions and 152 All-Americans. At one point, almost every single wrestler who won the NCAA championships during one year was one of Dan's. Needless to say, October 25th was Dan Gable Day in Iowa. So, fellow Googlers, please join me in welcoming Dan Gable, who will share the lessons he's learned. Wow. I thought you were really smart. <laughs> There's not a teleprompter, I promise. <laughs> I mean, that was really good, and I didn't realize that was there. So. Lamar, I said to hide it when Dan came on board. Oh, my gosh. That was that's pretty good. I'm uh, usually not a guy that likes to sit I'm too antsy, because uh, last time I didn't uh, really get ready for a match, I lost it. That was about the only time, though. But uh, there was reasons, and you, you have to uh, kind of diagnose that pretty well to figure out the reasons. But, you know, obviously uh, it was something that uh, you never get over, but you got to get on. And uh, it's one of these things for me that uh, it actually made me realize most people thought I was really good up to that point. When you win and go seven straight years without a loss and your record's 181-0, people think you're good. You know, obviously, uh, my opponent didn't uh, think that, or he took on the challenge. But what happened was then I was able to really go to a new level. And so it's, you wonder how the, some of these people at a certain level of efficiency, so you can take your own life uh, and you can look at it and say, well, you know, I'm at this level, and I've been working all my life to get to this level, but how do I get to that level? And maybe you can do it quickly, or maybe it's going to take time. If, if I had won that match, it would have taken me uh, a longer time than by losing that match. That was the first time I was ever able to experience something of that magnitude in a sport that actually made my efficiency go up really quick. I, I believe I would I say this. For seven years, be, from a sophomore in high school to my last match in college, I, I was on a trend like this. Seven years it took from this point to that point. But within one year after that loss, I took those seven years and I put it all in one gain. So whatever it went, the steep went like that. And in one year, I gained as much as I had gained in, in seven years. So I, I kind of look at other, I kind of figured that out through the feelings that I had. But I also looked at you know, things uh, later on and made me like look at a guy like Michael Jordan you know, and, and for basketball. And you know, he was one of the greats three years into his uh, is NBA, but he all of a sudden 
jump to another level of, of success. And I don't know exactly why he did that. It might be the 10,000 hour rule. It might be a lot of different things. Uh, you know, I looked at that 10,000 hour rule that there was a book out on that. And, and I, I did figure out my hours for wrestling. And I realized that 10,000 hours was already accomplished before I ever wrestled a college wrestling match. Uh, so, you know, to me, uh, there was a lot of time put in. Uh, it just so happens that my high school coach, who was a, as a famous high school coach, kind of realized that this kid coming in was, you know, maybe more of a leader than most. And because of that, he he did things that you can't do now, you know, I don't know exactly what you can and can't do, but you probably, a couple things I know you probably can't do is you probably can't give a first year high school student a key to the, the school. And you know, that's what he did for me because he knew that I was going to be the first guy there in the morning uh, opening the door. And he knew that if he didn't give me that key, he had, he had to be there at six o'clock to open it up. So it actually gave you know, him an opportunity to have another leader in the program besides himself. And he, and he was, you know, at a point in time in his life where, you know, maybe he didn't have the energy or, or whatever it was. He actually lived quite a, quite a ways away. So, you know, it's, um, you know, it was one of those things that he gave me the opportunity to help the team. And, and, and really, I was a young kid. And because I was a young kid, I really hadn't had that respect yet. So it was kind of, he didn't, he took a chance. So I heard a few things that I think the audience would love to dig into. It sounded like you were given a great opportunity early on, the keys to a wrestling room, you had mentors. Keys to the school. Keys to the school. Um, you had mentors. You had the right people around you. I also heard when you, when, whether it's the, the how many hours you're working, that Michael Jordan moment when you're, when you're learning just significantly curve. increased. The curve. Thank you. Um, I... I'm curious, like, which one of, trying to extract lessons here that, that we could all take with us. Those are the curve, the right people around you. Um, what are some other key lessons you think that in the next 40 minutes we should talk about? In, in addition to those, maybe if we just have three or four and then we'll, we'll hone in on those, break them down, see how you learned it, and then hopefully we can take it with us when we're done. Yeah, I think one of the key things is really what you're born into. And, uh, you know, I think that it's sad that some people are born into a situation that is almost impossible, at least when they're younger years. And, uh, you know, and so maybe, maybe that's a, a good place to start with mentors. And so everybody here can help the world, everybody. Just because you affect somebody, you don't, whether it be your children, whether it be your wife, whether it be girlfriends, whether it be your friends, whether it be whoever it is, or in, a, in another way. I mean, this company affects a lot of people, unbelievably. You know? And so for me, it wasn't the perfect situation, my mom and dad, but they did look out for their kids which was me and a sister that was four years older than me. So I, I was born into a good situation. It wasn't perfect, and I don't doubt if there's a perfect situation out there, but it definitely was a good one. And so they probably realized that they had more than they could handle with me, and so they gave me more opportunities at a young age, like, okay, this kid's got a lot of energy. Uh, you know, We want to teach him some things away from the home besides schooling because I really hadn't started school yet. But so they had the local YMCA. And they had good people that were working there. And they, they stuck me in programs uh, that actually helped teach me how to be a competitor, helped teach me how to actually have social skills, helped teach me how to actually have my first job, uh, you know, because they I, I actually got a job within the, the YMCA, and I only stayed at the YMCA from the years four to twelve. How, how did you go about that theme of you know acknowledging your current situation? What do you call it? Have a competitive advantage on? What could you make the most of? And and surround yourself with the right people. So it sounded like you you made you took advantage of everything that you had, 
What about when you were a coach for the Hawkeyes and, 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 and your wrestlers were training to become Olympic athletes, NCAA champions? How would you help them surround themselves with the right people? Well, you know, I'm a guy that communicates. And I had to learn the hard way. And so there's not a lot that's going to go on without me actually communicating something, whether it's been said before or not. I just, I don't trust and one of those things. And the reason why I don't trust is because we'll shoot ahead a little bit when I was 15. And so I'm walking to school. And as I'm walking to school, there's this kid that was in our neighborhood, but I had never walked to school with him before. And I knew a little bit about his reputation. And his reputation wasn't a, a real good reputation. He'd been in uh, kind of trouble quite a bit. But when we're walking to school, he just happens to say to me, he said, hey, Gabe, oh, yeah. I think he was a year or so older than me. And he just said, you know, you're doing pretty good in this sport of wrestling. Uh, that's good. That's good. You know, and he, he says, you know, you got a really cute sister. And then he told me about three or four other sentences that were, like, not so good. You know, you know, and, but, you know, being a young guy, you know, what do you say? You know, you know, it just, uh, it was something that stayed with me, but I actually never brought it out until after the fact. And so it was probably six weeks later when after the fact happened. And it was in a car ride back from a fishing cabin 100 miles from home from, with my mom and dad because my sister wasn't. Uh, she didn't show up on time that morning. And because of that, all of a sudden, I'm riding home. And by the way, he murdered her. He broke into the house and raped and murdered her. And so on the way home, I'm thinking about that conversation. And I got a mom and dad that are, you know, my mom that is hysterical in the front seat. My dad, he's, and I said, all of a sudden, I say to them, I say, I think I might know something about this. And it's like, how could, you know, my dad, how could he know something about this, you know, up here? And so he kind of swerved the car over, went out, opened the back seat up, kind of picked me up, kind of shook me. What do you mean you might know something? I said, Dad, I don't know for sure, but this is a conversation I had with this guy six weeks ago walking to school. You know, at first my dad was, he actually cracked me across the face, and he said, why did you say something? And I said, Dad, I just thought it was boy talk, but it was actually a lead, and they brought him in for question, and he actually admitted everything right there. And... Uh, it was one, he was a young, young guy, but you know, for me, it was like my family, what it did for my family, it just was going to tear this family apart, the family of three that's left. And so for me, it was like I didn't really feel the guilt, but I felt more like the motivation, like I knew that... Uh, this mom and dad, I needed to keep them together because they were just fighting and fighting and fighting, and they continued to do that. And just, I, I moved out of the my bedroom, and I one night I got up and I just looked at them in the middle of the night when they were, when they were like fighting and yelling, and I think it, it took a really strong statement to get me out of bed, and I I think the statement was really simple for my mom. She just said to my dad that. I wished I would have raised her to be, I think she said the word whore, you know, and then she would have gave in to him. And, you know, she fought her for her life to not give in, which commend her for that. But that got me out of the bed, and that made me realize that something had to be taking place. So a 15-year-old kid decides to move into her room that, because that room is kind of haunted ever since we moved into it. So when I moved into that room, you know, I that night, I actually just went in there and told them. And a little bit later, they just kind of snuck in there and looked at me, and, I, and they looked at me like I was sleeping. But I wasn't sleeping, I can tell you. But they, uh, it kind of started things changing. Uh, and the fact that it, I would wrestle for her and 
for them and for everybody else that uh, was pushing for me. But, you know, it just it, it gave me a lot of uh, motivation on, on, on such a such a, a negative aspect. But but, uh, you know, that's just that's just one thing, because adversity, you know, I'm going to talk, you know, adversity, it, it happens to all of us. I mean, it could happen uh, today, something. And it's, it's, I used to like have, I used to like talk about adversity in, in two aspects. Adversity, you take it on or you take it on. And I, I think we can probably find something in our life that we either are doing something or we're not about something that we should be doing. And I really only had that line for a short period of time. The short period of time eliminates the second part, adversity, you take it on. There's no or in adversity. And it's easier said than done, especially in, in L's and D's, life's and death. Wins and losses, that's another story. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, you know, you got to take that on too. But there's two levels of, uh, of grief there. And uh, obviously life and death is the one that's a little bit more difficult, a lot more difficult. But, but uh, the winning and the losing also can be uh, a pretty, can hit you pretty hard. So, you know, so I, I go seven years, I have a loss. And that, that's going to hit you. And that's why I was able to go to that next level. I've been hit hard at special times in my life. Record performance times. I mean, seven years, finally have one more match, only person ever going to be undefeated in high school and college. And, uh, and I get distracted. I um, I don't wrestle up to my ability, and and if had I wrestled up to my ability and done everything right, I could handle that. But when you don't do everything, when you don't do it right, and you get involved, you know that's uh, you know that you're better. That's that's harder to take. So then, as a coach, once you know it again, go almost 10 years without a loss at the NCAA championship from a team point of view, and then record performance, we lose. But you got to analyze those losses. You got to analyze the death, and, you know. And, and obviously, the communication aspect for me has never been a problem anymore. I, when, when I hear something, unless it's just dead silence, you know, that you got to keep this a secret because of no major reason or a, of a really good reason. You know, you got to communicate. But, but uh, you know, the wins and losses uh, after seven years and after ten years. They hit you hard, and you, you really go back and, and you figure out what took place. Go back 365 days a year, and I actually analyzed every day up to that loss. And even though the bottom line was the kid got inside my head, he used tactics. I never even really paid much attention to him on that loss until he came to the tournament, and all of a sudden at a press conference like this, he, he shot his mouth off, which, you know, I absorbed it, and my focus went from me to him. And because it went to him, I, I wasn't worrying about my skills. I was worrying about his skills. And when you go into competition, wins and losses, business and not business, you've got to focus on what you're good at. And when you focus on what he's good at, that means he's going to do something to you, and you're not going to be at the best of your ability. So, you know, that's that was pretty amazing. But my... Team loss, my team loss, if this was my team, it was because we were celebrating too much and because you just thought it was going to be automatic because you did this, you did this. Nothing's automatic. And there's always things that you can change. And when you see something that needs changed, and if you let it go in your life or your business or your family, Every day you let it go, there's a term called the longer, the longer. And that term means that the longer you let it go up front, the longer it's going to take on the back to really get back. Even though as soon as we lost, I thought we'd get right back on top. Well, it took us five years to go from we went two, two, you know, and, and three, and went all the way down to like six. And then we started back up again. But it took all that time just because it took all that time to tear us down. Now, 
you'd have to analyze how long you've been, like say you're in a marriage and you got to look at it and it's not going so good. You got to kind of look and see how long you've been uh, not being so good and, and don't think it's going to change right around. You almost have to build it up as long as you tore it down. But you're always hoping for the quickness, but the quickness won't be stable. And you need that consistency. I mean, that consistency is there. I mean, I'll tell you, it's 42 years now with my wife. 42 years of marriage. Same wife. Same wife. Uh, I, don't, I don't need that. Because it might be, she, you know, I don't know. But if I don't keep working at it, it's not going to be 43, I can tell you that. Uh, it's just, it doesn't, it's not going to be there just because it's, it's there. So, uh, you know, it's, when it was shaky, it was because uh, you weren't doing the right things, mostly. You weren't doing the right things. One of the craziest things that, one of the best things I ever did in my life, and I know it's not good for a lot of you guys or girls, is that 1980. Seven, which was 13, 16, 29 years. I don't know. Can you add? Or the engineers come out. With. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, I uh, came home late. <laughs> I had to get up early. So then I came home. And I said, never again am I going to go to excess. So it's been since 1987 that in one day, I've never had more than uh, two beers in my life. Uh, if I hadn't made that vow and kept that vow, I wouldn't have said 42 years. There is no way. Because that would have been gone a long time ago. That would have been gone. It's just something that, for me, and again, I've got to work on that, too, because these guys are trying to get me out drinking tonight over here, and I don't know. That's the wrestlers in business? Actually, I get, I, I get 32 ounces of beer, you know, because if you say two beers, I mean, some guy gives you a quart of beer, and then he gives you a gallon of beer, you know. So you've got to, you got to actually define it a little bit. And I've stayed, I've stayed that... Um, a game, and then you can't also use two days. You can't go in a row like, okay, it's 11:58. You drink two beers, and then it's 12:02. Next day, you can drink two more beers, and then you got a bigger bottle. But you gotta be smart. You can't. You gotta be right, exact, and no. And you know, now that I'm actually getting a little bit older, uh, even though I don't claim I'm over 29 on the workout machines, because they always say age, weight. Uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. I always say 29, and I always win the damn thing <laughs> over the 29-year-olds. I'm always ended up the first guy, whatever I went, 15 minutes at this level. Then they say it's how you rate, and I, every time I jump off, if it's if it's number one, uh, you know, I jump off. If it's number two, I got to go back and do it again. But uh, but uh, you know, that's uh, that's just the way I think. That's the way I think. But you know, obviously, adversity has been uh, something that I hate. I don't like it at all. A lot of people thrive on it. I like prevention uh, of adversity. The more adversity I have, the more I, I get down. But some people can thrive on it a little bit. I got a couple buddies that actually, that's the only way they can get good is if they have something go bad on them. But I like good, 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 good. You know, even though uh, it hasn't been perfect and I don't think there will be a perfect situation you know on this earth anyway so uh, but it you know doesn't mean you can't strive for it that doesn't mean I shouldn't have won that match but if I wouldn't have won that if I would have won that match the way I wrestled in that match I probably wouldn't have won the Olympics like I won the Olympics you know maybe I would have won the Olympics mm -hmm. but you know I won them and nobody scored on me the, I mean I think I, the last 21 matches I had Olympic competition and Olympic games was a hundred and uh, 30 to 1 and 12 pins out of 21 matches with nobody scoring on me. You know, that's like domination, kind of. And except for that one point, you know. 
Would uh, you give us any suggestions on how to find the lessons from adversity without having those catastrophic losses? Hmm. Being able to think that way, although you're not in such a situation, proactively hit that curve you were talking about. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> No, I just don't think you can be smooth sailing because when I longer the longer thing again, when I look at that coaching thing, I was um, uh, breaking down for at least five years. And by that I mean, so when we, we, we lost it in 87, so in starting of 83, I was not doing all the best decisions I could make. And the funny thing was, in 83 we won, in 84 we won, 85 we won, 86 we won. So, you know, Google, I don't even know what Google is, but I actually, I asked you about it. I mean, I knew what it was. <laughs> I and mean, I love your answer about making things easier for everybody, you know, because that's kind of why I was a good coach. If you're just a good wrestler, you know, you, there's ways to win. But as you go higher in a, a level, you know, once you go from high school to college and then, then on to your Olympic level, you're not going to win the Olympics unless you have both hard work and smart work. And so that efficiency of, of Google, of trying to make things easier to get to access and so on, that's like a wrestling match. I mean... I personally kept getting better all the time. And, I, and all of a sudden, instead of struggling to score, I could score quicker, easier, because the skills and the techniques were getting better. I mean, for me, I got this guy over here, uh, Nick Gallo over here, that I used to train with him all the time. He didn't like this hard, tough nose style wrestling that I had. He liked slick, quick. He didn't want to get tired. You know, for me... I had to take and learn some of that. I don't mind getting tired because I never knew I got tired. And so I, you know, instead of being really efficient, I just struggled, not struggle, but I would get to it and finish and win. But that's at the lower level. As I got higher, I had to actually know how to be more efficient. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I've seen five people try to jump uh, Nick Gallo and none of them could get a hold of him because he was like a, like a noodle. He'd grab him and he, you know, and and uh, so it, it, things like that kind of you, you got to be okay. So I'm going to the woods, and I love hard work, and I take my uh, nowadays I take my chainsaw. The old days you'd take an axe, but I'll tell you what, I run out of gas, my engine breaks down and I can't cut the trees down, I still have my axe with me. So I can go, you know, even though I got my efficiency, I'm going to do it, but if I have to do hard work and i got to get a certain thing done, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a backup plan. And a lot of people don't have those backup plans. And in your life, a lot of times there's, uh, you know, especially with Google, I mean, you're just constantly wanting to do things efficiently and everything. You know, sometimes you got to do a little hard work to become efficient, and you got to stay in that hard work. And, if, and sometimes you've got to work through that uh, to get to that great ability to dominate. For, so, so that's kind of my relation with Google. Wrestling, there's so many disciplines that you have to master. Otherwise, they show right in front of you. Everybody sees them. If you get tired in a wrestling match, there's two people out there. And if you see that everybody's going to, you know, all your coach, your teammates, all the fans are going to see who's going to be tired, who's not going to be tired, because they're going to watch shoestring tricks, or, and that's why they've eliminated those. They don't even put shoestrings a lot of times in, or they make you tape them. Or if you're going out of bounds and you want to go back in and they take the big walk around the circle to come back in to get their breath, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, just in life, say you have to make a weight class or you want to be healthy in life because I tell you what, as you get older, it's really critical to stay healthy. I mean, you think you're, you know, you're going to make it your whole life by not staying healthy. You can do all this and do all that. I'm telling you, you're, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. So, you know, for wrestling, a lot of times we have to 
master nutrition and conditioning. And so they, they go hand in hand, and you have to read about it, and you have to learn about it, and you have to understand. I'm surprised that some of the kids that I got from, to me from high schools, even though the top recruits, had no idea about the scientific uh, rules of, you know, like nutrition or uh, a losing weight properly. You know, and again, there's a lot of, I call them disciplines, but of course you also have to know techniques, you have to be updated on them, you have to, you know, know your tactics, uh, you know, you have to know your opponent a little bit. And so, uh, you know, it's just what builds your mind, what builds your mind. And because that's going to decide your mind is whether you're going to win and lose or how much life you got or you're going to be dead quicker. Uh, a lot of it, and whether it's, you know, I mean, there's free things that happen out there, but, but uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, one of my good friends just never stopped partying after college. He partied all through college, did really well. He was, you know, a genetic type guy, and, uh, and but he just kept on doing that in his whole life. And But about 10 years ago, you know, when he's carrying his, you know, oxygen tank around with him because he smoked all the time and he drank all the time. And he gave up smoking, you know, maybe seven years ago, I think it was, eight years ago. And so he had 20% of one lung tw at seven, seven years ago. He still got 20% of one lung. It's pretty amazing. I mean, today's a little different. You know, my mom and dad smoked, drank pretty good, but, but the smoking part... But there wasn't really any, you know, information out there. And, you know, it's, you know, they, they lived till 67 and 73. You know, you know, I got, I got a ways to go to get there. I'm 29. But, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's uh, one of these things that I know I, I've never smoked, really. Maybe as a kid, I shouldn't say that. But I never inhale. I just thought it was cool to smoke Swisher Sweets. Swisher Sweets down by the, when I was in sixth grade and seventh grade, sixth grade, I think, uh, fishing. But, you know, it was just a temporary thing. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, it's just one of those things. And like I said, two beer limit probably helped me a lot. Right. And, you know, that's just one of those things. But, you know, I do have my drawbacks. I just want you to, there's no perfect situation out there. I, I, I was Mountain Dew. Mountain, Mountain Dew. That's yeah. the drawback? Yeah, I just, somebody's got to kick my butt and get me off that. <laughs> but nobody can kick my butt, so. <laughs> Nick, do you want to challenge that? Or? <laughs> I know all his weaknesses. Uh, yeah. None. Hey, yeah. On the mat. So thank you so much for sharing your, your life story, your perspective on on just accomplishing anything. So I feel like we have so many pieces of wisdom from everything you just explained. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to invite all of you to, to join us. I will ask a few questions. Before I do that, though, um, Dan did author his autobiography. Do you want to tell us about the, this book, which all of you can, can buy back there, and then we'll move to Q&A? Should, should we buy it? Unless you want to get pinned. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, it's a lot of people have bought it, bought it, but uh, you know, it's uh, one of those things that if you're not, if you like books uh, that are, you can read a chapter and set it down and come back to it. That's fine. This is the book. I mean, it's like uh, every chapter is a new chapter, and it's there's there's a lesson in every chapter. In fact, I got a new book coming on in about a year, but. I took a lesson out of each chapter and have a chapter on those lessons in the next one. So, you know, and this book actually says a lot of good things about not just wrestling by any means, about family, about, uh, uh, you know, like uh, my best friends growing up. And there's a lesson with each one of them because you know, I didn't get to be who I am by just me and my mentors of my mom and dad. It took a lot of help from a lot of people along the way, whether it be at the Y or whether it be my coaches or teachers or my friends. My friends, I mean, my friends were like, they looked out for me because there was this crazy kid that was a fanatic, somewhat. And so my friends taught me about having a beer. Mm -hmm. And they taught me about 
girls. <laughs> My know? favorite uh, lesson that I got from this book was when you were coaching Barry and how you empowered him to be an NCAA national champion. You didn't scare him to it. Uh, Barry was not always sometimes into it, sometimes not. He was, wasn't sure if he really wanted to move through and put all the dedication into winning the national championships. And, and Dan was just by supporting him, empowering him to accomplish what no one else was able to in his weight class. And well, Barry Davis you're talking yeah. about, who was a three-time NCAA champion. Well, he ran off on me, and I had to find him. Most people, when somebody runs off, they don't even bother to go find him. Well, I'm pretty much of a Sherlock Holmes expert, and so I had a lot of that train when I was growing up. And, and so I always got a lot of people to help me. To, to It wasn't just me looking for somebody. But, but Barry, I had to uh, find him, and I got a little lucky there, and I think the more prepared you are, the luckier you get. So I did l luckily find him and at a point in his career, which would have made a big difference in his life. And, uh, you know, I also, um, when I did find him, pure emotion happened between me and him. He was going to run off, and, and uh, I actually broke down crying a little bit. And, uh, but I never pressured him to come back, but he wanted to. I mean, he was just waiting for me to find him, but he was hiding. And I got lucky, and I found him. So it's like, wow, some things aren't. Some things are like karma. There's like, how'd that happen? But um, but Barry is, um, you know, he's still working on him today. I mean, even though he's a coach somewhere and doing a, a, a mentor of kids, and that's how I measure people. So I measure people by, by not like really how they did with me back. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whenever it is, I kind of measure people like where they at right now. And, you know, that's to me more important. And the ones that have really gone on and, and do well, then I'm really proud of them. You know, and if they've taken care of their family and, and if they've stayed within our profession, you know, so like you, you know, you, you just you just don't let it go totally. You, you, you live on it because you know what? It's more about people having these things to look up to and it's, it's and it's like i could you know i could it could be gone tomorrow you know but it's like will you really be gone or are you going to live on and are people going to care you know that type of thing and so you for me it's like i want to forever live <laughs> you know even though i'm not on this earth and if i can do that that means i've touched a lot of people and, and i've given a lot of people a chance to uh uh, be a little bit better with with their own lives, and so like I said, family of four, three. Uh, I'm the only one that's alive. Now oh, it's a family of 21, and we talk about that a lot in this book. And that 21 motivates me. That's why I'm here, for my sport and for my family, for my sport and my family, and it's gonna be good for both of them. For me being on. A Google Talk, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, is this going to actually go out to people? Uh, your call. Huh? Uh, you can decide later. Oh, wow. We can edit it. We can take out the part of you beating up Nick and whatever you want. <laughs> well, actually, Nick Nick is a guy that has scored some quick takedowns on me because he's slick. And you know what? I had to learn. You okay I, with us putting that on YouTube? <laughs> of course. Nick Gallo? Yeah. Right. He, he already beat my guy in the national finals, so he's. I can... Give him some credit. So we have uh, we have a question over here. Thank you. Hey, Dan. How's it going? Thanks so much for your words of wisdom. You touched a little bit on nutrition. I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for resources for understanding nutrition that are you know your favorite resources for understanding nutrition. Well, I usually like to read books that are directly related with wrestling, but that's probably not for the the normal. But but you know because of you have to be in superior condition in wrestling, you know, they're, they're, they're probably pretty good. I used to have an, I think it's called an encyclopedia of, of health, but, but uh, you know, but it was involved with wrestling. But I tell you, there's so much there and so easy to access to get it to. I mean, you just go online, I think. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Here's the thing with it. And again, there's so much that isn't good so you got to go like to a really a knowledgeable resource because people are always trying to make money and a lot of that stuff isn't for real so you just got to go to the general knowledge and go from there do you have like a top you know one two or three recommendations in terms of you know maintaining good nutrition like 
well, yeah, like the top me one or two. Long enough. <laughs> but right. actually, um, I think for me it, it's the scientific point, and not just the made-up type of things. So I really, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, if you see something that, that looks easy, you go back to the actual science of it. So, so are you gluten-free? Hmm? Are you gluten-free? Have you heard of this? Paleo diet? Uh, I'm just a general science guy. <laughs> Find the right scientists and, and No, I'm sure I'm a Thank general you. science guy. I don't go for these uh, fads. Uh, one question over here. Hey, so uh, you were talking about adversity a lot, and I was wondering if you have any uh, personal experiences or tips or tricks you have when you're uh, competing and you're not performing the way you wanted to perform and you weren't doing your best at, you have a trick to get yourself to do again what you want to be doing in well, mid-match. Well, for me, anytime I'm experiencing something that I don't like, I go the healthy route, and that means I go to the gym, or that means I go to the wrestling mat. Some of the worst times in my life, and you could have laid there and just keep suffering, but I actually got up and went to the gym, and I called somebody up to get a wrestling match in. Or uh, even during the days, you know, when my sister was first murdered, it was like, what do you do? You, everybody came over to this one house, and everybody was just on this one house, and all they did was just kind of look at each other and talk, and, and I had to get out and do some exercise. I think exercise is one of the best uh, things that can actually get you in a different frame of mind, at least temporarily. At least temporarily. It will um, make you feel a little better. And I know that I, I take it right on again. I take it right on, and that's one of the ways that uh, I've been able to do it. Uh, yeah. Also, any mid-match, uh, mid-match mentalities. You're in the middle of a match. Oh my gosh! Well. If you have to think during a wrestle match, you're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what what I do sometimes. I have had to do it, and I talk myself into performing at a higher level. I can remember I went in overtime once, and I knew I didn't perform during the match. It was kind of a hangout match, and I've seen I never do that. And so when I was in the corner, I was just kind of talking myself into um, I got a higher level that I normally compete at. In fact, my athletes actually, some of them, but to get their game face on, wanted me to slap them a lot. And back in the days, I hadn't coached for a long time. Back in those days, you know, you could get away with it as long as you, they told you you could do it, and their mom and dad told you you could do it. But now, today, they can tell you, and you got to have a signed agreement. And then you, and the parents can tell you, you got to get a signed agreement. And then you got to go get a lawyer and make sure all this stuff's worked. But so it's a little different to, than today. But, uh, but I can remember I've uh, sometimes had to pull a trick or two out of your hat. And usually, if you have a tremendous reputation going into that, you can pull a few tricks out of your hat and get away with it. Uh, but you don't want to have to count on it too much today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Please. Hey, thanks, Coach, for coming out. I uh, have to say I appreciate your comment about Mountain Dew. I actually gave up soda when I first started cutting in the eighth grade, and I haven't had a sip since, I, I want to say it's like 2004. So that's all you got to do. Well, I can't I say I took the same that. route on beers, though. No, I, I, oh, you've had more beers? <laughs> yeah, you a more? couple more than that. Oh. Uh, Did get you in trouble or not? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, my, question, my question for you I wasn't. was, I think we, we really appreciated your story of adversity and working through that yourself. But as a coach, how do you approach uh, maybe your athletes or your wrestlers who are going through adversity? How do you, instead of approaching it from your own head, get out of your head and in, inside your athlete's head to help them through it? How do you approach that? Well, the number one thing, you got to develop some kind of a respect. And that's on an everyday basis. And so over time, they will look up to you. It's just like a parent. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, from a standpoint that if your kids just don't, if you don't treat them right and don't do things right, you're going to have a lot tougher times. So it's a daily uh, thing that they all of a sudden see that that they really that they know that you they really you really care, and that you're working harder than they are. That's a, a real key thing, and not necessarily uh, just during the match, but uh, or during the uh, 
the practice, but forever. You know, it's just that whatever they're doing in terms of their two hours of hard work, you're putting in 10, you know, hours of work or whatever. Uh, you know, that's another thing. Some people like don't like to take home what they have to take home. They like to leave it there and come back and get it. I'm just going to tell you, I've been one of these guys that I've been able to take it home. I've been able to take it home with me. And now, and if I bring it home and it's not good, then that's not good. If I bring it home and, and uh, share it and they, uh, the family is on your side, which my family is on my side. That's one of the key things. I said four, they were all on my side. The 21, including me, they're all, all on my side. And that means, and a lot of it is because of the amount of success, too, that you're having. If you're doing all this and it's just not successful and it's not good, then you won't have those people on. So uh, I don't know where I went with that. But, but anyway, didn't I meet you in the bathroom today? For context, we were washing our hands. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, you did. I love that we have uh, a handful of wrestlers here. I want to save uh, a time for, for people to buy books and, and give autographs. We'll, we'll finish right after this question. No, they got two more. Two more. Three more, actually. Hey, Dan. Um, so what fascinates me about uh, successful athletes is not getting to the top. It's how long they can stay at the top. And I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about what drove you or what motivated you mm -hmm. to continue to get better after so many years of success. Mm -hmm. Well, I really do believe that if you don't have a lot of success, you're, you're going to fall off somewhere, and you're not going to keep that drive. And I do feel that the drive from the success really helped me. And, and, and at, the, at the crucial times of, of I had all this winning, and then I had a loss, you know, that's a major adversity. But, uh, you know, it's just that you have so much success, you know what that feeling is like, and then you, when you don't have it, it's, it's kind of devastating. So you, I think you do have to be successful a lot to be able to sustain it, sustain it. Uh, it's one of these things you get up there. I think I, think I say that, uh, you know, that my, um, my low point is like at most people's peaks. Uh, and, and, and because by that I mean when I drop down a little bit, uh, you know, it's like it's still higher than almost everybody else in my work ethic or, or my smartness you know, for my sport. And on a daily basis, when you're up at that level, you got to have you can't stay up there. I don't like to use the word can't. I shouldn't, shouldn't say that. But, you know, it's like you still have to have what's called. And again, this is really critical. And I, I can't believe I haven't pointed this out because this you have to have what's called recovery. And a lot of and people say, oh, I'm going to go fishing once a month or once a year. That's going to recover me for the year. Or I'm going to I'm going to go uh, uh, do something and I'll be ready to go, you know, for another year. Hey, it's every day. My recovery is every day. So our, where was what was I doing this morning when I first got up? Well, I was in the uh, steam room. I was in the sauna. Uh, you know, I was in a I got a massage. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, you know, I, 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 I do things and that's one of the keys. So when I come home from work, uh, I, I, I do things that are going to help me recover to be ready to go for the next day. Most of them were like for wrestling, but it's your whole life. So it could be my homework when I was a kid, you know, that type of thing. But I, I could recover really quick, really quick. And part of that recovery is because I did a lot of things to my body and mind that, I, that nobody else did. So practice was over. I stayed after. But then I went through all these things, hot, cold plunges, hot plunges. You know, if somebody was there in college for a massage, you know, if, if I get in a, you know, I just, I'd work on that, but I didn't really know what I was doing until I became a coach. And then you kind of di diagnose it, dissect it, and then you say, this is it. So my teams could work extremely hard. This team could work extremely hard, and you could come back and do it again tomorrow, and you're totally recovered because you have a recovery process. So, you know, I, like I said, when I wanted to go fishing, I had this cabin up north in Minnesota. But I only get up there, you know, three weeks a year, maybe two weeks a year, and all at the same time. So guess what I did? I built myself a cabin in my backyard. Yeah. So I go, go to my retreat every day. That's where I, plus the fact that once I retired from coaching, and I still wanted to work on my sport and my life. My wife's house was 
her house, you know, and so she kind of said, why don't you build one just real close? <laughs> but, you know, it's like, I've never had to sleep in it yet, we'll, but, there's, uh, but there is a bed there. We'll, we'll have to create our own cabin in one of these MKs. For, for the remaining two questions, feel free to just approach. Let's uh, give Dan a thank you, a round of applause. <laughs> books in the back, we'll do book signings, we'll be here for 10 minutes.